Excellent. Okay. So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Sylvia Sachdev, um, who's the Herschel Smith Professor of Physics at Harvard, um, who's joining us um, today with uh, some of his group members um, from Harvard. And it's, it's wonderful to have a large crowd in our usually very technical, very small um, seminar series. Um, I, I want to remind everybody that, uh, uh, I guess, including Sabir, that um, um, the kind of nature of our seminar series is we try and encourage lots and lots of questions, which I'm sure you're, you're okay with. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, so the talks are available um, on our YouTube channel. I'll send, I'll send out a link to Severe for those of you at Harvard and for those of you in Cape Town. Um, I'll, I'll post it on our webpage as well um, once the talk is available. So um, Zubir will be telling us about um, quantum statistical mechanics of strange metals and charged black holes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so you can hear me okay? Uh, better to be here. Yep. Perfect. Well, at least virtually. Actually, I was just thinking this is probably the first time I'm giving a physics talk in Africa. <laughs> He said, but not in person. Uh, but anyway, so good to meet you all. All right, so here's my uh, title. I want to tell you about the connections between the SYK model uh, and strange metals and also charged black holes. Um, the work, the connection to charged black hole is uh, somewhat older work, and a lot of it is reviewed in this article that just came out in Reviews of Modern Physics, uh, which I refer you to. And I've also spoken about it many times at other talks that you can find on my website. Uh, so I do want to, you know, I mean, I'm happy to spend as much time needed to uh, on the connection to black holes, but I do want to also come to some more recent work on connections to strange metals. Okay, so here's my uh, ambitious outline. I'll just introduce the SYK model and just focus on a particular property of it which actually connects directly to charged black holes. Uh, and then I'll give a review of you know, some uh, experimental properties of strange metals, um, and then try to describe them by an SYK type model. So here we're going to need to really extend it to, to make it much more realistic. <laughs> Uh, you know, the basic point is that the SYK model is it's a toy model that you introduce to understand uh, dynamics of particles with strong interactions. Uh, and the remarkable fact is that the toy model is all we need to, to extend to the black holes. But for strange metals, you need a bit more, quite a bit more, as you'll see. All right, so here's the model. Uh, I'm going to consider what's often called the complex SYK model because it's important for the complexity means that there are these are fermions whose number is conserved. Uh, and that's really important for the strange metal application. And it's also actually also important for charged black holes. All right. Um, so you take fermions with some interaction, U alpha, beta, gamma, delta, where alpha, beta, gamma, delta labels some sites or orbitals, whatever you want. There's N such labels. Uh, and there's an interaction between fermions. Um, and this interaction uh, has is are in these these n to the fourth uh, numbers are independent random numbers and we take them to have zero mean uh, and uh, root mean square value u. Okay, and these are fermions obeying the usual fermion anti commutation relation. Here's the charge density q, uh, which commutes with the Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, so it takes values between uh, zero and one, and uh, I'll mainly focus on one half, but uh, okay, so that's the model. You know, these two lines fully define the model and uh, you could give it to a mathematician and uh, that's all they need to know uh, to figure out various properties. So the, the way physics physicists proceed is uh, you, First, look at write this as a path integral, um, and look at the partition function, and then you average over the u alpha beta gamma delta, and that averaging introduces a lot of simplification, and it really is the key to solving the problem. 
And the reason you can get away with uh, looking at the average partition function is that this model is self-averaging. Uh, that is any given realization of U is the, has the same properties as any other in the large n limit. Uh, and uh, so that's something that's very useful and allows us to make a lot of progress. So if you average the partition function, you end up with uh, this theory. So this is an exact representation of the partition function. Uh, and you're able to uh, manipulate it in a way that the size of the system just appears as a prefactor and that's it. And instead of having a path integral over n fermions, you just have a path integral over two fields. But strictly speaking, these are bilocal fields. They only depend on time. The Green's function, what will be the Green's function at the saddle point and what will be the server energy at the saddle point. And this is the basic structure of it. Uh, this comes from the integral over the fermions. This is the interaction as four powers of G. Um, and this just tells you that sigma and G are you know, inverses of each other. Okay, so this is uh, really all it is formally and everything what we tell you now uh, just follows for the next, from evaluating this partition function. So in the large end limit, you just look at the saddle point, but now we know a lot more about this uh, and in slightly different situation, even exponentially small and n corrections are now very well understood, uh, but I won't go to that. Uh, so let's just talk about uh, the large end limit, then the, these sigmas and g's become functions only of time differences. And these are the uh, basic equations. Uh, this is Dyson's equation and sigma here is g cubed. And you know, these equations are what uh, Jin Nguyen and I wrote down in 1992. Uh, and uh, it's only now that we are understanding, even though the equation looks so simple, we are understanding, you know, we have a more complete understanding of the structure of the solution of these equations. So it's now a mathematical problem to solve this set of equations. And then plug it back in here and learn something about the partition function and do fluctuations about this arrow point. All right, so the RMP article uh, goes through you know, all of those steps. Uh, and so I'm just, I'll quote some results for the partition function, uh, which is the trace at fixed Q of the Hamiltonian. And by usual thermodynamics, they define the free energy and an entropy. But what's often useful in the black hole connection is to express the partition function in terms of a density of states, D of E, which are just a series of delta functions at the exact energy eigenvalues uh, of the Hamiltonian. Now, it turns out that to have very accurate results for the partition function, you don't need to know exactly uh, every eigenvalue. In fact, the values of EI depend on the U alpha, beta, gamma, delta. You have to tell me what every one of those is to determine the EI. But the self-averaging property referred to is one of its consequences is that uh, you don't need to know, you can just coarse grain this a little bit uh, and D of E becomes a smooth function uh, and that gives you really the partition function very well. Okay. So what is the, the basic result? So let me just <laughs> write it down. So this came over you know, many years of work. This is the, the basic result for D of E. Uh, it's coarse grained a little bit of, of over energy width of order E to the minus N. Uh, so it has various factors. Uh, first of all, there's this factor here, which is energy independent. Uh, and it looks like a zero temperature entropy. And in fact, that's really what it is. And the value of the zero temperature entropy was what we computed. I computed with uh, Antoine George and Olivia Parkelet, and it's, it's some number at Q equals one half. You can get it at other numbers too. Okay, then the energy, so that just comes from really understanding the saddle point solution very carefully. Then we can go a bit beyond the saddle point and do fluctuations. Uh, and this is what leads to you know, quantum gravity. Uh, there's a theory called JT gravity, which gives you this answer. Uh, it's cinch of square root of two n gamma e. Uh, and finally, there's a non-exponential prefactor uh, that was obtained only recently and 
uh, okay, that's rather special to the structure of the SYK model. Okay, so that's the basic result. And let me just compare that result with numerics. So here's you know, a, an exact diagnosis of one sample. Uh, these are energies uh, you know, binned over a certain small energy interval. And these are actually all, and this is the energy eigenstates at the bottom of the band. And these are the, you know, the exact eigenstates at the very bottom. So if you look here, and not too close to the bottom, um, then you know the naive. You know you, you can guess the D of each is just the exponential of the entropy. That's simply Boltzmann, uh, and it turns out that the entropy uh, can be computed uh, from the large end saddle point, and it turns out to have a zero temperature value that I just told you, and also a linear and T correction. Then it's a matter of converting from the canonical to the microcanonical ensemble, and this expression here is exactly equivalent to this one. That's just a very simple exercise in thermodynamics. Okay, so this is where, this is what it looks like here. Once you know the entropy is linear in temperature and has a zero temperature value. What about at the bottom of the band? Well, at the bottom of the band, you get the same factor, but you also expect you know, the density has to vanish at the bottom of the band with a square root edge. And so you put in a square root. Uh, and now you compare these two and you interpolate with it between them. And the cinch is the simplest function that interpolates between these two. So that's basically the meaning of this answer uh, that there's some universal density of states, uh, which corresponds to energy levels that have an exponentially small spacing down to the ground state. So there's no degeneracy, even though there is a zero temperature entropy, uh, the zero temperature entropy is not the same thing as, a, as the uh, ground state degeneracy. There is no ground state degeneracy. It's just that the energy level spacing is very tiny as you go down to the ground states. And these states you know, change chaotically from one state to the other. They have no relation to each other, except that their energies are very close to each other. Okay, so so that's uh, the basic property of the SYK model. And this actually connects directly to black holes. And then we summarize how that happens. Um, so if you go back to the time of Hawking and earlier, uh, you know, let's take a black hole solution of Einstein and, uh, and Maxwell because I want to charge black hole. So this means that some mass and charge somewhere uh, but we solve the equations outside the black hole uh, where there's no mass or charge. So we just solve the vacuum Einstein uh, and Maxwell equations. And there is a solution with the boundary condition that there's some mass M and charge Q at the center of the black hole about which we know nothing. Uh, but just knowing the mass and the charge, you get uh, some metric, which I'll show you a version of it in a minute. Uh, and if you now take that metric and go to imaginary time, which is what you need to do to evaluate the partition function according to the usual rules of quantum mechanics and the Feynman path integral, you find that the metric has the shape of a cigar. So this is the radial distance outside the horizon. And this is imaginary time, which is a circle. And everybody knows that the circumference in imaginary time is h bar over t. So, and this, you know, this imaginary space-time just ends at the horizon. So in fact, it, it never goes inside uh, about which we know nothing. So what uh, um, Gibbons and Hawking very boldly said, well, just let's just take the saddle point of this because this H bar is very small. Uh, so let's take the saddle point and evaluate the action and therefore get the leading exponential approximation to the partition function. And they just evaluated outside the black hole. And the, really, the, ultimately, the only place H bar comes in is in the fact that this, uh, this time circle uh, is H bar over temperature. Uh, OK, so if you evaluate that, you get the famous result of uh, Gibbons and Hawking and Hawking earlier uh, that the black hole has an entropy, which is just proportional to the area uh, of the the surface area of the black hole. 
Um, and if you take the zero temperature limit of the charged black hole, then it actually has a smooth zero temperature limit and you get a constant lesser term linear in T determined by the uh, zero temperature area, which is, uh, is related to the charge in this very simple way. Uh, the temperature is another, you know, you can take charge and temperature as your independent variables. And the two of them determine the mass. And uh, so it's just more convenient to work uh, with fixed as a function of charge, temperature and, and charge. And then the mass is some derived quantity. Okay, so this is you know, quite an amazing result because it tells you there are degrees of freedom that gives you an entropy, uh, but it doesn't, but you have computed it without knowing anything about the inside of the black hole. Uh, you know, what, what's the particle content, uh, you know, the strings or whatever at high energies, none of that matters. This is the answer that you get. Uh, okay, uh, and it is indeed correct. And, you know, in, more, in condensed matter terms, you would say this is a universal property of a black hole, independent of microscopic details. Uh, but the amazing thing is that not just this entropy, but even more is universal. And that's what I'll tell you now. So for now, and this is something I, I noted a while back, if you look at this entropy and many other properties, they look suspiciously like the SYK model. In particular, the entropy is a constant plus a term linear in T. You know, this comes just from solving the Einstein equations. Uh, whereas the constant plus linear in T for the SYK model came from solving a particular Hamiltonian. Okay, so there's a lot to that. And to understand why, we, want, we need to understand this linear in T term better. Uh, and the linear and T terms comes from a very special feature of a, uh, of a charged black hole, which is that, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, which is that the metric, which is, you know, uh, four, four dimensional, very far from the black hole. But as it gets close to the horizon of the black hole, the metric factorizes into a two dimensional metric which represents the radial coordinate zeta and time tau, and the angular metric, which is this omega two. And the metric, the, the singularity structure is that the, the radial part is much more singular than the, one, than the angular part, and you can just ignore the angular part. And if you just do a careful theory of this two-dimensional gravity here, where the metric is ADS2 close to the horizon, and also take into account some boundary effect where the metric changes from two dimensional to four dimensional, uh, then you can deduce the linear T term. Okay. Uh, but you can do much more now because you can also evaluate the full partition function, not just the saddle point. Okay. So, so I'm not giving any details of this. Uh, this is all in, uh, for example, reviewed in the RMP article. And, you know, these steps are all done by other people, not by me. So in particular, what you do is you, at least most of them, <laughs> you take the Einstein-Maxwell theory uh, and you go to low temperature limit and you can just reduce it to a theory in one space and one time dimension. And this theory just turns out to be precisely what's called JT gravity. Uh, you pull out the, the, the saddle point factor from uh, which is the Bekenstein Hawking result. But now this theory, uh, this partition function in one space and one time can be evaluated essentially exactly. Uh, and, a, and another remarkable fact is that this partition function in one space and one time direction is precisely related to the lower energy limit of the G sigma theory I told you earlier. You get exactly the same. If you start from Einstein gravity and take the low energy limit, you start from the G sigma theory um, of the SYK model and take the low energy limit, you get the same theory. And in terms of the SYK model, there's a time parameterization which corresponds to, uh, you know, the fluctuations of the, this boundary graviton. All right, so you can do the partition function and when the dust settles, uh, you get this correction uh, to the entropy. Uh, there's the bekenstein hawking term, which is about a one over G, and you get a term about a one, uh, which is about a th minus three halves log T. <clears throat> okay, 
And, and this is also a property of the SYK model, which I, I guess I maybe I didn't mention that earlier. There's also additional log terms, which are temperature independent, uh, that were first computed by <laughs> Ashok Sen in 2011, um, but there were there was additional contributions related to this 2D gravity that he uh, ignored, and these the the whole thing has been computed uh, very beautifully in a recent paper just a couple of weeks ago by Luca Eliasu, Samir Muti, and uh, Joaquin Turachi. Um, who came up with this coefficient. So this coefficient here, 559 over 180, <laughs> uh, that depends upon knowing something about what the universe is made of. Here we're assuming the only massless fields are uh, the graviton and the photon, and then you get this number. But everything else actually doesn't depend on knowing anything about what is the matter content of uh, particle physics. Anyway, so you can take this entropy and convert it to the density of states, uh, and this is your basic answer. <laughs> so now you'll notice it's almost identical to the structure of the SYK model. Here's the Bekenstein Hawking term. Um, and uh, this is a cinch, this cinch of square root of E. The same thing appears here. Uh, and the prefactor is uh, I had a factor of one over n, and here it's uh, roughly like one over n to some n to some very strange factor. And this is not as universal because it depends on a little bit about the low energy massless matter. But everything else is completely universal. Uh, and we see how that happens. Uh, and the beauty is, you know, this is some continuum density of states. But the beauty is from the SYK model, we know we have at least a realization of discrete energy levels, which have exactly this feature. Uh, and there is no degeneracy or anything. Uh, there's just exponentially small spacing of levels. And you know, and this is in stark contrast to what's been done in string theory, where you have low energy supersymmetry. You know, essentially all previous discussions of black hole entropy uh, using string theory um, ha have a delta function at zero energy uh, and, and a huge degeneracy. These are the BPS states. The degeneracy is, in fact, the Bekenstein Hawking value. Um, that's a you know a important result, but in fact, the the delta function is not generic. It's really an artifact of the low energy supersymmetry. Uh, and if you remove the low energy supersymmetry, uh, you get back to this picture, and this this is the correct result. Uh, and there have been, a, you know, since this result, there have been uh, uh, many extensions, in particular, uh, Saad Shankar and Stanford even looked at exponentially small corrections in 1 over G. And these turn out to be important for computing uh, entanglement entropy of evaporating black holes. And, uh, and so many basic puzzles in this, the page curve and entanglement entropy uh, are now being resolved. Uh, at least in this model, in models where it's reduced to two dimensional gravity at low energies. Okay. All right. So that's uh, my survey of just one set of results uh, on charged black holes and their connection to the corresponding results for the SYK model. Uh, so I'm happy to pause here. Uh, if not, I will then change gears and talk about strange metals. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so let's get to the more recent stuff. Sorry, so we are, I, I have a question. Yes, yes um, it, It's maybe a little bit, um, I guess, tangential to what you speak, to what you're talking about, but I think possibly leads on to something like this. But do we, do we know how finite end corrections affect the self-averaging? And then by extension, all the things that depend on the self-averaging? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, well, so the Green's function um, is, uh, this is for the SYK model, of course, it's self-average, but there are corrections to the Green's function. Uh, and uh, this is something actually we have been looking at recently and their corrections are order one over uh, N cubed or something, which uh, change the Green's function. Uh, so the root mean, the variance of the Green's function is non-zero at order of one over n cubed. Um, you know, um, 
for the density of states, uh, well, I mean, the density of states is a coarse grain density of states. Uh, we are coarse grained over an exponentially small interval. Um, there are possibly uh, power law corrections to that coarse grain value, but uh, I, uh, I think uh, Verba Schott may have studied some of those. Yeah. But they don't change the basic structure here. Uh, then there are corrections, uh, you know, which are exponentially small in N. Um, these turn out to be very important at long times in real time when you're computing, uh, say, the spectral form factor and so on. And this is the kind of thing that Steve Schenker has uh, really studied very carefully and, and Douglas Stanford and others. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so there's basically kind of the boring connections that just come from doing, uh, including the replica of diagonal terms and just doing uh, one over n expansion more carefully. And then there are the wormhole corrections, which are exponentially small, but in certain circumstances, those are the important ones. They dominate everything. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a technical question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Just, uh, I was uh, about that zero temperature entropy. Yes. Um, do you, so you get it from so the 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 density of states has this square root factor. Is that is it because yeah. of the square root that uh, the low the zero temperature entropy is non-zero? It's not like if no. you had a D of E that had some other form of like I, I no just trying to understand is, how the you know, if you look at this, those are really two independent things. Uh, there's a prefactor which is exponentially large. That's what gives you zero temperature entropy. You could have had the square root edge without the exponentially large prefactor. I mean, and that's, I, I yeah, uh, that's kind of what happens in a Fermi liquid. I don't have the plots here for a Fermi liquid. Uh, yeah. It's the fact that there's this N there. That's what matters. That it's uh, this N is the, yeah, the that, uh -huh. you know, that's the whole story. Okay. Got <laughs> it. This N. Uh, you know, this was, we discovered that N in, in this paper with George and Parcolet. And in fact, we only discussed this in the appendix of the paper because we were, we were very disturbed by it. You know, so what uh -huh. is entropy? Is there some degeneracy or something? And what's going on? Uh -huh. We don't really understand it. Uh, of course, now we have a much better understanding because with the, this new version of the SYK model, you can just put it on a computer and see it. You can just test, and in fact, you know, numerical. If you just look at the numerics of this and how it scales with n, you you it indeed fits this quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, what it's really telling you is that there are these extremely chaotic states without any, which have, don't have a quasi-particle description, which all have nearly the same energy, mm -hmm. but they don't. They're not exactly degenerate, and this is kind mm -hmm. of a. It's really the main property of the SYK model that allows the black hole connection and charge black hole connection. I see. But in terms of condensed matter, if you have a you know realistic system of fermions in finite dimensions, you don't expect a zero temperature entropy. Uh, and so I'll now talk about extensions of this as well. You know, we're going to we have to learn the right lessons from this model. <laughs> and uh, and it so I'll, well, I'll let you judge, you know, how well the extensions work. Okay, so let me just, uh, you know, well, I guess for the quantum gravity people, this will be some very messy solid state physics. Let me just show a bunch of experimental data uh, and just highlight a few features uh, that we want to understand. Um, and uh, okay, <laughs> so it's good to see that uh, some real world data. Uh, anyway, so the strange metal um, is, you know, most prominently appears in the high temperature superconductors uh, near what we call optimal doping, where TC is very large, the highest. But if you go even higher in temperature, which is still from the microscopic scale of very low temperature, uh, you get this regime we call the strange metal, and I'll talk about some of its properties. Um, okay, so one property is that the resistivity is a linear function of temperature, uh, and this is data in the cuprate and twisted by layer graphene more recently. Uh, and also the, the fact that 
it's not that it's linear in temperature, but it's linear in temperature down to very low temperature in a way that the resistivity is very small, a small, much smaller than the quantum unit of resistance. There's a whole other class of materials, which are often the same materials, which at higher temperatures also have a linear to resistivity, uh, but, but the resistivity is very large. And these, we, I think, are more probably called bad metals. Those are somewhat easier to understand, and I won't say anything about those here. So that's one property. If you look at the specific heat, uh, again, in a wide variety of materials, you always see this logarithmic enhancement of the Fermi liquid value. It's T log T uh, as temperature goes to zero. Then you can look at what's called the optical conductivity. This is just the conduct in response to a time-dependent electric field. Uh, and there was this, uh, you know, very influential paper by Dirk van der Merrill, who saw, you know, in this uh, infrared regime, a power law dependence with some power law, strange power law of you know, two thirds, which certain theories seem to be saying should be present. Um, so that all, <laughs> so that all looked very exciting. Maybe there's some kind of non-Fermi liquid with a strange power law. Uh, in the conductivity in, in the infrared. Uh, but now it's, it turns out there's two developments. One is that the experimentalists have changed the interpretation. They've said there's no power law. And theoretically, uh, partly as a result of uh, how you goes work, uh, we know that this C constant is actually zero. So, the, so both theory and experiment have come to the same conclusion. This can't be right. For now, let me just say what the experimentalists have said, and this includes Dirk von der Merrill and Antoine George and others. So they've said the power law is really due to a logarithm uh, and a much better fit to all the data as a function of frequency and temperature is provided by if you write the resistivity in this form. So this is some relaxed, this is some scattering rate tau. Uh, and if you just did you know, from a liquid theory, you get a, some scattering rate tau and, and some effective mass m star. But more generally, you can say, well, let's allow this to be a function of frequency and of course, temperature. Uh, and then causality says that one is the Kramer's chronic of that. And then you take the scattering rate and say it's linear function of frequency. So now, you know, this have the, the left and the right hand side have the same dimensions. This is a, a frequency, that's a frequency. So in fact, uh, the prefactor is in some sense universal. This is, uh, so it's either linear function of temperature or, or, or of KBT over H, linear function of frequency or KBT over H bar, sometimes called Planckian behavior. Okay, so if this is a linear function of temperature or frequency, that would of course be the same, you know, correspondence you would expect from the linear function of temperature and the resistivity, which is at zero frequency. So that seems, you know, plausible. And then there's M star, but when you take the Kramer's chronic has a log, logarithmic violation of scaling. You get a cutoff dependencies. And that log, uh, you know, mimics a strange power law. So now when they redid the analysis, they found that this form works beautifully, not just as a function of frequency, but also as a function of temperature. Uh, and, and you do indeed see the log temperature dependence uh, in the effective mass. All right, so that's the basic summary. This is what the optical conductivity looks like. Um, it has a linear frequency or temperature dependence, seemingly in agreement with the DC conductivity or resistivity. And finally, there's also photo emission experiments. Um, and okay, this is written in some rather strange way by this work. But the basic exponent here is alpha is close to one half. And so this is roughly consistent with uh, linear frequency dependence in the self energy, imaginary part of self energy. And that's what's called a marginal Fermi liquid spectrum. Okay, so these are the basic properties. And we'd like to have a theory that can explain all of them together. Uh, and so our recent work is, I think we have a candidate, at least, you know, it can, it has all of these properties that we haven't fit anything quantitatively, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do that, but it has all these properties and I'm not aware of any other model that does. So I'll show you what it is. 
Okay, so so to to reach this, we we studied not uh, we, the correct starting point turns out to be not the SYK model itself, but something now at least in condensed matter people are calling the Yukawa SYK model. Okay, so and this is work with uh, uh, Avishkar Patel, who's a postdoc at Flatiron, and how you go, a student at Harvard, and uh, Ilya Estelis, who's uh, uh, will be going to Wisconsin soon. Okay, so here's one particular SYK model, a Yukawa SYK model. This is actually in the paper by Estelis and Schmalian. Uh, but there's many others who have looked at related models, including uh, Jeff Morgan. So here, instead of having uh, just a fermion, uh, you have a fermion and a boson. So in this case, the boson is just a set of harmonic oscillators, all with the same frequency omega zero. And the fermions are also dispersionless. They're all you know, at the same chemical potential. And then the entire physics is in this coupling, this Yukawa coupling. Uh, and in the spirit of the SYK model, you take n flavors of fermions and n flavors of bosons, uh, and you make this coupling random in your cover space. And then when you uh, go to the same song and dance as before, uh, you end up with the saddle point equations, which now have this form. Previously, you know, sigma was just g cubed. But now sigma of the fermion is G times G, fermion and boson, and sigma of the boson is GG of the fermion. Now these equations are in the condensed matter context, sometimes called the migdal Eliasberg equations. Uh, you know, the, the phi was a phonon and so in their treatment. Uh, but these were, you know, they're kind of non-systematic, especially when you, put here the full Green's function, not the bare Green's function. Uh, and really this taking these random coupling constants is the only way I know of to systematically get these equations. This is, if you want a large end saddle point that gives the Miguel Alasberg equations, then you have to take these coupling with a random and flavor space. Okay. Uh, and, and you know, I mean, these equations have been known, as I said before, but nobody really solved them carefully or looked at them seriously in the fully self-consistent limit, precisely because there was no justification for doing that. But now that we have a justification, people started doing that and all kinds of uh, remarkable things were discovered. In particular, if you solve these equations self-consistently, uh, oh, before I get to that, uh, you could also, yeah, I should have said this earlier. <laughs> You can just take the average partition function and now you get you know, the analog of the G sigma theory. Now there's two Green's functions, sigma and D, G and D, and two self energies. You know, it looks very similar. You look at the saddle point equations, here they are. And you solve them and you get some strange power laws in the Green's functions, uh, where delta is determined by some equations. And so you get a non-fermi liquid with all the same basic properties uh, that I showed you for the SYK model, everything will be the same, except the, the value of the number S0 will be different, uh, and uh, but everything else will be pretty much the same. But now it's fermions and bosons. Okay, so, so why do we like having fermions and bosons? Because then it gives us a, a physical way to get a non-fermi liquid behavior. In particular, imagine you have some kind of phase, quantum phase transition, where you know, some symmetry is broken. So one very simple quantum phase transition where, where the symmetry you break is just the square lattice symmetry. People call it the Isaac pneumatic order. So you have some scalar field phi that tells you locally whether the, your Fermi surface uh, has, is elongated in the y direction or elongated in the x direction. Uh, and there's some coupling constant lambda when the lambda is well, okay, the arrow should be the other way. When lambda is large, uh, then the system likes to elongate, but it has a choice and in, that breaks the symmetry. So phi is like an Ising order parameter. When it acquires a wave, you have uh, an elongated Fermi surface. When it's not, uh, then phi is zero. And this phi, you know, become very singular and become very important right near the quantum critical point. So we want to study this phase transition. 
or and now the, the arguments I'm going to make apply to many other phase transitions. This is this is the simplest example. So how do we do it? Oh, oh yeah, okay. So this phase transition here then controls a quantum critical region, and we would like to understand something about the transport properties of the system here. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, uh, you uh, uh, first thing you have to have a Fermi surface. You can't take dispersionless fermions. You have to have the notion of space and a momentum. So you go ahead and start with the Fermi surface. And then these fermions now interact with each other with some interaction J. Uh, it's not a purely local interaction like here. There's various form factors that I've just omitted for simplicity. Uh, okay, so now since this interaction is very strong, you decouple it by the Hubbard autonomous trick. You introduce a, a field phi, a scalar field phi, which couples to the appropriate order parameter. Again, there's some form factors that are not written and the J goes down there. All right, so that's your theory that you'd like to solve. Uh, and, you know, I think we know a lot about this theory now. Uh, and in particular, if you want to do it systematically, uh, you introduce a coupling constant G, which is random in flavor space. You introduce a flavor index, just like in the Yukawa SYK model, uh, and your coupling is random in flavor, but not in positions. You also have a position space. So, but uh, in addition to time, so it's more complicated. And so the Green's functions um, are now functions of both uh, momentum and frequency. Uh, but you get the same sort of migdal elasticity equations, and you can solve them near the quantum critical point, and uh, you know that's there's a huge amount of work on that starting from 1989. Uh, and what we know uh, that the self energy at low frequencies has this strange omega to the two thirds behavior, which is of course you know the same power law that was seen in optics. So people thought oh, we are getting somewhere, but uh, unfortunately this behavior of this in the self energy doesn't appear in the conductivity. So we, then you compute the conductivity, uh, and I'll say a little bit about how that's done in a few minutes when I get to a, a better model. Uh, and what you find there is that actually the conductivity is just that of a perfect metal. And this is simply a consequence of translation invariance uh, and momentum conservation. Once you set up a current, uh, any state with non-zero current has a non-zero momentum. Uh, and although the momentum, uh, and since the momentum is conserved and the current is not, the momentum will remain the same and the current will acquire a value which has the maximum entropy given the momentum and that value is not zero. So the current doesn't decay to zero and there is a delta function response. Uh, you can look at the finite frequency response. Uh, and again, you, as I said earlier, uh, the omega to the minus two third term has a vanishing coefficient. So this is all very boring. I mean, it, it seems like you got a, a, a non-Fermi liquid in the self-energy with this strange power law, but the transport is not strange metal-like. Uh, okay, so we have to, so that's the basic point. You took a completely translationally invariant model with no spatial disorder. And it's a non-Fermi liquid because the self-energy does have this omega to the two thirds, but it's not a strange metal. So there are no quasi particles. That's good. We got somewhere. There are no quasi particles, but it doesn't look like anything like the real world. All right. So we got to relax uh, momentum conservation. So how do we do that? Well, we add some random potential. This is you know the entire theory of disordered metals is based upon this random potential. Uh, we want to do it in a regime where, of course, uh, phi is becoming critical, like at that critical point. So now in blue, I'm, you know, this is just a static field, V of R, uh, which has zero mean and mean square value V squared, which is local in R. Uh, the red are all dynamical fields, okay. So now we do have some spatial disorder, okay. So this you can also solve by the tricks that you apply for the SYK model. 
where you uh, just make everything random in flavor space, but you also have to then remember that uh, the correlations of V are also random in position space. And that just changes things a little bit. I won't show the details because I will show them when I finally get to the model that, that I want to talk about. Anyway, so you solve this model by the same bag of tricks that people have developed uh, for, for the Yukawa SYK model, essentially, with an additional momentum index. And when you do it, you do get something very promising. You find that uh, the boson Green's function has this diffusive form at the critical point. And this implies the fermions, uh, in fact, do have this marginal Fermi liquid behavior, where the scattering time is linear in frequency or in temperature, scattering rate, sorry. And correspondingly, this T log T specific heat is present. So I had these four properties of strange metal. It's got two of them. It's got these specific heat, right? It's got the self energy, right? Uh, and in fact, this was actually known uh, and mentioned in passing in this old paper in 93. Uh, okay, but the other two properties having to do with transport don't work out. If you just continue to look at this, you find that since the inelastic scattering is still mostly forward, uh, the behavior of the transport is just, you know, what you would learn of in Ashcroft and Merman, and there's just a residual resistivity from the impurities and some uh, boring T squared power law, uh, and nothing in the optical conductivity, no tails other than the drew to peak, due to the singular fluctuation of phi. Okay. So, so that doesn't work. So that's another failed attempt. We added potential disorder V uh, and we got some half of the way there. We got a marginal Fermi liquid, but it's still not a strange metal. All right, so at this point, we were ready to give up on this whole line of ideas, but fortunately we didn't. <laughs> and so this is the key new idea in our recent work. Uh, Okay, so here I'm actually showing you experimental data. Uh, this is the data on some uh, local density of states as a function of energy uh, in a high temperature superconductor. So I don't wanna go into any detail here, just to give you an impression that there's a lot of spatial disorder uh, in the local gap. So there's some gap due to superconductivity and the gap you know, uh, has, different values from all the way from three MeV to nine MeV, depending on where you look. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, in the superconducting state and hence in, you know, hence there is the disorder in the gap and the, consequently there's also disorder in the coupling between the, the fermions and whatever boson is introducing superconductivity or the quantum critical point or whatever. So what we have, so this is the key point. What we want to do is to take this coupling J, which was just spatially uniform and now add a spatially random term to it. Okay. Uh, in addition to the usual potential term that you add to the fermion. And now you see that you can actually, it's convenient to rescale this, rescale phi. Uh, so that phi squared has a constant coefficient. And then the coupling, the Yukawa coupling now has two contributions. Um, it has a spatially uniform piece and a spatially random piece. Okay, so this is our model. This is the model we want to study. Uh, we have a Fermi surface. We have some scalar field, uh, which has a Yukawa coupling to the fermions on the Fermi surface. Uh, and this coupling has both a spatially uniform and a spatially random part. And this you can just keep, you know, because it's the, in real world, it's also there. Okay, so the blue terms are now have this delta function correlation in space. They're fixed fields in any given sample, uh, which are random in position. All right, so this theory now we solve by introducing another flavor index, giving everything a flavor and making all the coupling random in flavor space, taking the large end limit and uh, taking the average. You know, it's just, you could have done all of that without introducing the flavor space. 
but the flavor space large and limit tells you and all its successes tells you that that's a good thing to do and will keep you know all the keep track of all the consistency requirement on the conservation of momentum energy and all of that properly okay so this is then the g sigma theory you get uh you know so from the syk model the main differences are now the sigma and g are bilocal functions not just of time but also of space and the, these nonlinear terms are of two types there's the usual term ggd this is what you would get in the you know the problem without any spatial disorder what you get terms here g you know which have which are proposed to v and g prime which were the blue terms earlier i should have made this blue here with a delta function extra delta function here Okay. Uh, Sorry, sir. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. In the previous slide, the g plus g prime of r. What is the prime there? Is it just to denote a different g or? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not a derivative or anything. Okay. It's just another another couplet. We sh maybe you should have used tilde. Okay. So um, then, yeah. Okay, so then, since the the red g is constant, um, yes. Can can and and your blue g prime there is is taken as a random. Yeah, you uh, cover cupping, right? Right. Can I can I think of this as as a random coupling with correlation, uh, correlated random coupling, or something like that? So we did this in this no, paper it, with it's a, uh, it's a random coupling with the non-zero mean. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I mean. A shifted shifted um, yeah. uh, random coupling. Okay. At right. least as written as that's, but when you take the large and limit the flavor indices, it's useful to separate the, the mean from okay. the, okay, from the fluctuation. Okay, thank you. Right. So this is the theory we'd love to solve and we can't, you know, this is too hard to solve. <laughs> uh, but I know that Avishkar, for example, is uh, putting this theory on a computer and doing Monte Carlo. And let's see, you know, it looks promising so far from what I've been told. But we're going to solve in the large and limit and in the law by taking by introducing this flavor uh, index as an auxiliary tool and then when you take the large n limit this is the exact representation of the average partition function we are averaging both over spatial disorder and over uh, flavor disorder and this is what you get <laughs> uh, and then you look at the saddle point equations and uh, here they are you know these are essentially the migdal aspect equations probably been written down you know millions of times and very thousands of times in various papers in condensed matter except for this g prime term i don't think anyone's written down the g prime term well there is this paper by ehud altman and avishkar patel and others that had only the g prime term which came just before our work okay so this is so everything i'm going to tell you now now you can now it's just a problem of solving these equations looking at these equations and solving them and everything we've learned from syk is you know given us a lot of tools on how you solve these equations and i just go ahead and do that and you also can look at response functions so to do that you take this theory you add some external sources and then you take derivatives with respect to the sources in this theory and that will tell you you know what you have to do which is I mean, that's effectively what uh, Kitab and uh, Maldusena and Stanford did to compute the short chain action and so on. They were just looking in response to external perturbations. And we do the same thing here, except with more indices. Okay, so when you do that, in particular, you know this the basic property we had before of marginal fermi liquid behavior this the two successes and the self energy and the specific heat that's preserved you just the coefficient of this omega log omega and also of this scattering rate is has two contributions one from the v term and one from the g prime term uh, okay so they both contribute to the single particle relaxation rate but what we found that this term, even though it contributed to the single particle relaxation rate, did not contribute to the conductivity. But for the G prime term, since it doesn't conserve momentum, there's no such issue. So even though this cancels out of the conductivity, this doesn't. 
And then you get everything you need. So to compute the conductivity, I should say you compute, I described the procedure. It ends up being equivalent to summing, you know, these graphs plus repeated laggards of all the graphs here. These are sometimes called them. Uh, this is called the Marky Thompson graph. This is called the Aslamazov Larkin graph, these two. And you have to include them to all orders. And again, these graphs have been written down thousands of times. Just people didn't solve them carefully enough. That's really what it is. <laughs> uh, once you have a you know systematic approach, then you're more, much more motivated to really solve and seriously sum this and do this carefully. And when you do it, you get everything, <laughs> all the four uh, criteria. You get, you know, sigma of omega is exactly the form that I wrote it wrote down earlier from the experiment. So the experiment was wrote down. This is what you have. And in fact, this tau transport has a linear and frequency term, but the coefficient is just given by G prime. So, you know, V doesn't, G and V don't combine to give you this. Even though they give you a linear frequency term in one over tau as a self image. In the transport, only G prime does the trick. Uh, and so M star, which is also a transport quantity here, uh, it's a bit unfortunate people call it M star because this M star is not the same M star you would get uh, in the self energy uh, in this in this theory. You know, in some other th Fermi liquid theories is the same M star, but here it's not. And the difference is this has only G prime and not G. And that's really the key point of the whole story. All right, so you get uh, everything you wanted really. <laughs> All right, so that's very encouraging. Uh, it's you know, there's a very simple model, uh, and there's a large and limit, and uh, things are not quantitative yet. Uh, but you know, that gives us a lot of uh, more things to work on, and we're doing a lot of that. So that's the main point. Uh, when you have the interaction disorder in the coupling constants, not just in the potential, you get everything that's needed. Uh, margin Fermi liquid and a strain model. All right, so that's the end of my talk. I guess I timed it correctly. Um, so to summarize the main point, uh, the SYK model, um, it's a toy model. I know we were just playing around in 1992, 93. Just we wanted any model, no matter how artificial, which had no particle-like excitations. Uh, and now over, over the years, well before particle physicists under, you know, got interested in it, we understood that it had this, uh, and especially in work with, by Olivier Parcolet and Antoine George, uh, has this Planckian time behavior, no quasi-particle excitation. And more recently, uh, you know, uh, the maximal chaos in the many body sense. Uh, okay. So the amazing thing is, at least to me, even though this is a toy model, you don't need to change anything and it captures certain universal and important universal aspects of the low energy theory of charged black holes. You know, uh, and, uh, and this is, you know, I think very encouraging because you get a generic theory and you also get a very simple Hamiltonian that gives you a toy model of the microstates. Uh, you know, this is not to say that inside a black hole there's SYK, there definitely isn't. Uh, this is a model that has the right, there's a certain universal structure that it captures and having a specific Hamiltonian that realizes the universal structure has turned out to be very useful uh, in, but to people in black hole physics. <laughs> uh, and I should also mention, you know, all the, all the string theory computations um, of black hole entropy are also also about charged black holes. Uh, neutral black holes are much harder, and you know there is no no such corresponding understanding. Um, and you know I mentioned the four basic properties of strange metals: linear to resistivity at low t, t log t specific at low t, uh, one over omega up to logs, optical conductivity, and marginal Fermi liquid electron spectrum. And they all arise from this SYK Lake model, provided you have spatially random interactions and you're in two dimensions. I should have mentioned that earlier. Okay, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Sivir. Um, any questions? Uh, 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 I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, you've now got this really beautiful theory. I'm quite excited. Thank uh, you. Yeah. So, do you have any? I mean, you're studying a subject which is old, and there's been a million experiments on all kinds of things, right? Yes. <laughs> Is there something you can predict that hasn't been done so that you can come out and say this, you know, this is it or, uh, yeah, I guess <laughs> that's very much on our mind. Yeah. We, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, let's see. I mean, I so, see. okay. There is one prediction, which is, uh, you clean up your sample, get rid of the disorder uh -huh. and you are still in some, you know, uh, strong coupling regime. Uh, with, and you will not see the linear key resistivity. Uh -huh. So there's a, you know very clean prediction. This is, so our theory is falsifiable. So that's but it's you know you have to find a sample that has no disorder, uh, you know, and uh, that's very hard because the dopants always introduce some disorder. And there's always something, uh, but recently there's been actually in in graphene. You know, there's been mm -hmm. this work uh, by Andrea Young, uh, where he's been looking at trilayer graphene, no twist, and no he has twist. very clean sample with huge mean free paths, but a phase diagram that has superconducting phases and other correlated insulators and everything, just like twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, and I've been talking to him a little bit, uh, sure. and there he does not see a strange metal. <laughs> Whereas in the twisted bala, you always see a strange metal. So, uh, yeah. So, so then you know. he could put in disorder and maybe <laughs> the strange metal appears. That would be. Yes. Right. Well, as you can imagine, <laughs> experimentalists are not too keen. To yeah, he's not too keen to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. I ho hopefully, we'll, we, have give, we have put, you know, we have made enough strong claims that he will finally do, do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so when you say he doesn't see a strange metal, you mean one of those four properties breaks down? All of them. He sees none of them. All of them breaks down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he sees another. So that's another point, uh, which is I guess emphasized really only recently in this paper of uh, Sean Hartnell and Andy McKinsey that I cited. Uh, they particularly emphasize that you know even though strange metals are found in so many different systems. Uh, they're all basically the same in, in terms of these four properties. Uh, and uh, so to me, that's an indication that, you know, you're looking for some very simple universal type theory, which doesn't make too many assumptions <laughs> and is generally valid. And I, I, you know, and I think that's, that's a problem. That's a property our theory has. Okay. Well, let's see. <laughs> We haven't fully convinced the referees yet, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so then, can I can I ask a follow up question then? Which yeah, is, sure, please. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, I, I have to agree with Michael that this is this is very exciting. This is nice to see that you know you have one model, all of these properties um, hold in this model. How how robust are the results to you know model specifics? So if I change, you know, there's 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 a whole cottage industry on, on variants of the SYK model, right? Um, and a lot of them exhibit similar properties to the SYK model, and then they're just variants of the of the original thing. But you require specifically um, uh, spatial disorder um, in the couplings, and it sounded to me um, like you needed to have a zero mean as well. Um, well, so if I change the type of disorder, for example, does that change... Yeah, these right. Parties. So yeah, so there's you know some things we needed to do because that allows us to make progress in actually solving things. Uh, but if you ask me, you know what, you know, how general do I believe the results could be? So so I think the general things you definitely need uh, are you need a Fermi surface. You need some electrons that have a Fermi surface. Okay, no big deal. <laughs> Every system has that. And you need some collective mode that's going singular, you know, some collective bosonic mode. So this could be an autoparameter, a quantum critical point, 
it could be a gauge field, it could be, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be some kind of uh, play boson near certain transitions. So, and exactly what that collective mode is may differ a lot between different systems. Okay. And then the most important thing, which is new, is that you need some um, some spatial randomness uh, in the coupling between the the Fermi fermions and, and the collective mode. That's those are the essential properties. Then to solve that problem, we make you know a lot of us additional assumptions to make the theory tractable. <laughs> uh, but I do believe that you know from the structure of the graphs and things that we've been looking at, which as I've emphasized many times, they're not new. Everybody's looked at these graphs before. And we just looked at them a little more carefully. Uh, and uh, the, from, from all of that, I'm confident that's all you need, but we haven't shown that. I agree, we haven't proven that. Uh, but you know, I'm hopefully people would now do Monte Carlo without making further assumptions. And uh, I know that Abhishekar already has made progress on that. And uh, let's see. So, and we are also in answer to Michael's earlier question. We are, you know, we're trying to uh, compute other things. There are a lot of other things that we could now look at, including onset of superconductivity. Uh, well, and uh, um, yeah. Well, various other properties, uh, nonlinear responses, uh, many other things that act, uh, cyclotron resonance, things that have only recently been measured. Um, so, and these will all place further constraints. And uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, there's no shortage of measurements, like Mike mentioned, Michael. You know, this, this, it's hard to make predictions because it's hard to think of an experiment that hasn't already been done. But hopefully, yeah, let's see. We're working on it. <laughs> Great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if there aren't any others, um, let's thank Severe again. Okay, thank um, you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Really excellent talk. It's wonderful to have you speaking, and, and I hope uh, I hope in the very near future we can invite you in person. Yeah, well, I yeah, sure. My my both my daughters have been to Cape Town, but I haven't. I haven't been to Africa at all. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. We we'll, we'll 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 try to change that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All Take right. care.